Uh, thank you for all of your audience to attend this session. Then this is about uh, Chinese security. Actually, I come from Hong Kong. Would like to uh, share my personal experience on the kinds of censorship to have kinds of East meets West seminar then talk and much more sharing. Um, censorship is not just for China, but many countries or many nations have censorship. So that's the reason we like to trigger the research and trigger our, our ideas how to protect our privacy. Um, for me, then I will, go to, I will talk about censorship overview, the Tor and bridges from Jacob, and the Green Dam and Green Dampers from John. Uh, okay, there's no national secret. Okay, no. Is any spies, any China spy, Chinese spy, Taiwan spy? No worries. All things from the internet. <laughs> Search. <laughs> oh, I've got my objective right now, right? Be relaxed, okay. Encourage technical research and technologies in privacy protection and how we do the um, work out the censorship and share my personal experience with you guys. Okay, let's start. Um, I work on penetration test, um, like a co audit and a training, and do the malware analysis. If some of guys, some of you, then attend my Black Hat um, session about China made malware, then it would be, hope you like it. And also, I set up my research group, my maybe study to exploit, analyze malware. Yeah. And this is what I've done censorship. Um, this is, uh, I will go through this list in 15 minutes. Then in around 50 slides, then you will, you will find it very, have a rhythm, okay? <laughs> IP blocking. Um, actually, IP blocking is very, I mean, it's very easy one. It's a white listing, uh, black listing, uh, black listing, not block listing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you will find it in 202, and when you go to Google, then you will find it to the maze. You will find the exactly color of the, oh, sorry, exactly color. This is the search engine in China, okay? The Google, the blue one, the same. The fonts is the same. The bar, the location is the same. Yeah. Then we go to google.com, you go to the uh, teamwen.com. Yeah. These are kinds of DNS poisoning. And like uh, use um, points in the Sun file, use, use the packet ingestion. And another issue is about the root server issues. As especially for me, in, uh, I tried to collect to some China proxy in, uh, in uh, proxy servers in Hong Kong or even I traveled to China. When I go to Facebook, actually we solved we solve the IP 66.220.155.153 and 115 is the correct one. However, you find it here, the 93.46.889 actually is a false one. I mean, it's not exists. They do this kind of DNS poisoning. There's a root server in the internet. However, there's a news um, just in uh, March. It's about when you go to the YouTube, Facebook, and the Twitter, you redirect to the servers in China. And also, like um, after talking about the NS server, we are talking about China product. Okay, China made product is great, man. Right? <laughs> You find an SMT server, SMTP server. You find it there's a withholding policy. Oops, the policy here, right? Okay, and there's a also like how to an audit email, audit emails. Then you could audit the username, and also like. The administrator could audit the email, right? And got the usernames. Right? Very good filtering. And of the keywords. Yeah, you put any keywords as you like. This is my first time to find a server, SMT server, with this powerful censorship ability, capability. And some basic UDP and TCP weapon, like uh, TCP traffic and UDP session hijacking and collection time and reset. This I will not go through, it's a basic TCP handshaking, right? Just handshaking. However, when I would like to do kinds of, um, go to this website, applediday.com.hk, um, it is blocked in China. Once I, I visit them, they provide feedback me different resets here. Resets, resets, resets my connection. 
and go to the, it is a, a type in the Chinese, it's about 1989 democracy campaign in Chinese. Then I got more reset. <laughs> yeah, powerful reset. There's a research paper about how to identify forged reset packet. And go to a, Shanghai, I go to the expo, the Royal Expo, it's a long queue. Anyone go to the China Expo? Wow, great. You need to have a queuing up or have a wheelchair. Then you could have a fast expressway into the, <laughs> in the expo at the museum, okay. And I tried Facebook, Google Surfaces, and Twitter, YouTube, I can't go there. But you can only get reset. Oh, this is the site. Actually, you could check whether your site is blocked in China. However, this site is blocked in China. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let's guess GFW. No, not BMW, okay. It's a Greek firewall. Yeah. This is a GFW um, diagram, but not, not officially. It's guessed by the bloggers. However, these diagrams are put in the individual uh, researchers uh, in China. But they put it like that. However, they put, I mean, they put off in a few days. They've got a bad list, content filtering system, keyword list, okay, and also permanent bad list, okay. And there's a many, I mean, it's a very daily bad list. There's a many human resources to spend on the time and to filter, to, to find the sensitive words. QQ, do you know what is QQ? Like MSN and like, uh, like uh, uh, ICQ. However, very interesting. There's a news from, uh, from the internet, I got it, that, that once you install the QQ in a PFIS version, then it scans your machine. Yeah, it is an antivirus capability, maybe. You scan your executable and scan your document to see whether any embedded shell code. I don't know, <laughs> but simply they put it like that. Scan all stuff. Yeah, good scanner. And also it's a Skype, it's customized by China's lead by Tom.com. Actually it's in the Tom.skype.com, Tom.com has a specialized, specialized edition of the Skype. If you want censorship, please go there. Download it, <laughs> install it, you enjoy the keywords filtering. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there are many 47 million registered users in China using Tom's Skype. Okay, however they changed the code. The town to come change the code without uh, authorization from Skype. The Skype CEO comes to here and say, oh, I'm sorry, we don't know they changed the code. And also it's like uh, another advanced censorship, upgrade your software. Actually, another news is about a uh, Beijing, uh, some kind of people for human rights. However, when he logs to log, try to log into the QQ and find that there's a box like, please upgrade your QQ. However, his fellows to log in with in his machine and with this one account, but there's no upgrade request. It's quite on one-to-one -one monitoring customer surface. <laughs> this is a phishing for censorship, right? Asking for the person for upgrade, however the target's friend, knock in again, no. No such upgrade prompt. Hopefully I would, I would not get it. An ultimate censorship weapon is the 7-Eleven um, Korean store like the staff there to monitor the block, monitor the forums in 10 seconds a few minutes, if we talk about some sensitive thing, then we will be moved. Quite efficient, right? And this is what we are talking about sensitive words. Um, when, you, and when, you talk, when you type in this, this uh, Chinese word, means um, commemorative, this word, it's broke because uh, maybe near the time of some sensitive period for the government. We call this sensitive words. So this is a trendy China language. When, when the, your language, maybe your message is broke, it will place with these sensitive words. Then some China um, netizen make a joke with the government like, I love Beijing. Actually this word is Tin Amen. Then, then broke it up. Then they put a sensitive word. I love Beijing sensitive words. Sun wises at sensitive words. Our great leader sensitive words. Guiding our community to progress. <laughs> <laughs> and Another joke is uh, like uh, the, the China growth 6.4 percent, but it is bulked to 6.4. <laughs> <laughs> okay, green them. Okay. Sometimes uh, this is the one I like a lot because I, I do the reverse engineering the, uh, in the I mean in Hong Kong about to to know how it works and about filtering back content for the youth like the sex and and some bad co violence content. 
and however, um, some exploits found and cooks are suspected from, um, oh, I have not did, cyber cyber, cyber sitter. Yep. However, the China government will, uh, would like to install it, but it is banned. Okay, I put the baby face, I test it. It's nude and broke. <laughs> I put, uh, up here, I'm sorry. I hear, you find it. I put uh, some wordings about 64, uh, 4th, uh, 4th of June, then it is, I write it like in the look pad, it's bulk and cute. Yeah. I put the chairman here, and, and he said, it is an inappropriate pictures. <laughs> why? Why scan, why censor our China chairman? And also, why censor our communist logo? <laughs> and said, this is um, a, a bad picture, your highlight here. <laughs> and also, I do some kind of um, very uh, simple US engineering to find it. Uh, there's a loss of the executable they are monitoring. Right. QQ is there. Yeah, different executables. Email, look packed. The most rich is about uh, when you go to this um, internet cafe, then you need to register your name. Okay? And also the IPv6 will identify the location and address of the information of, the, of the, those lettuces. And another project is about uh, a Reps Chamber, pro Reps Chamber project. Uh, actually, it's an open project for how to bypass the GFW in China. And it, is, it applies to, uh, to refer to the, to the paper, research paper, about uh, ins uh, insertion, invention, and denial of service. And it's very good for that they could manipulate the research paper and to do some work. Then what is the theory on that, be behind that, is to send a thin, uh, uh, thin packet from the client to server, and the GFW believes the client has end the connection. Then the server will ignore the thin, and the packet sent from the clients will not be monitored by the GFW. Another, this, another point is the client send an ARC packet with incorrect sequence number to the server, and server replies with RST packet to the client, and GFW is cheat, and also is the server has terminated. The connection it stops the monitoring and censorship. Okay, it's very good. I, I love this kind of research and application. Can we load and reset packets and send by server is no longer affected by the GFW. And set up the GFW and DNS reply fingerprint. If there's a, the fingerprint is um, posted by the GFW, we simply filter, filtering out right. At the normal GF, um, normal DNS reply, we will not be affected. This is the I mean. The diagram, the throw. Yeah. We like that. <laughs> These are pictures captured from our, our local newspaper. Yeah, you'll find it's a battleship. <laughs> and thank you to um, this Japanese uh, Edo star, because uh, there's a news about in, uh, in the April in 2010, and actually he go to the Twitter. You could at him, at her right now. And Met, there's uh, over 40,000 netizens who would like to go to Twitter and buy, try to bypass them to bypass firewall at, on that night. So if they are at those star, radio star, much maybe helpful to the but helpful to education. Rather than I'm st stand on the stage to talk about bypassing censorship or working on censorship. Now, like the summary, then you do a censorship. Sometimes you are more like to increase the workload. Okay, you increase the resources a lot. It may not solve the problem. And the, my summary is encourage research to inspire, I mean, the creativity, creativity. And other countries may have the, I mean, the cens censorship strategy, but we need to have a balance between the privacy and the censorship and build up the business opportunities like the VPN. Most of the chi Chinese in business there is work on the um, VPN service, I mean, the VPN connection for in the company. Okay, it's tricks part. Thank you. So be, before you get started here, Jake, why don't we uh, throw out one of these guys? Oh, what, yeah, sure. Anthony, you want to describe what, what the hell this is? Um, this is uh, a horse. But this horse is with a very great zoom in piece, this one. It's, uh, because this horse is called Cholima. It's a grass wood horse. Which is it? 
in uh, in the China, there's uh, some kind of foreign language like a uh, it's a motherfucker. Okay. <laughs> however, however, the the censorship broke it up. So they use grassroot horse in alphabet and use their communication in the forum. However, the China, I mean, their censorship also broke it up. So I'm now trying to forward this Cholima to you guys. Okay. So I want it. Was it? Oh. Yeah, uh, hopefully you like it. Um, but don't do this, don't speak like that in, to the Chinese, okay? <laughs> okay, so, um, so um, part of the thing that people generally want to do when they're in China is they want to get around the Great Firewall. Um, the thing is that I want to make it, I mean, we're giving a talk about China, but I want to be kind of clear. This applies basically to everywhere in the world, including the United States. Um, depending on where you are, there's some guy sniffing the network or some girl sniffing the network and they're going to do some nasty stuff. So we have a couple things we need in order to be resistant to these types of censorship attacks. And one of the things that Anthony talked about was the idea of detection, right? So like you, you have a keyword, it goes through, and when you have this keyword on the network, the network is able to sort of detect and react to you. So one of the things you want to have is confidentiality. If you don't have confidentiality, it makes it really like extremely easy for someone to like, especially if they're on the local network, they can, they can intercept anything and they can send resets. Like they could be much better. They could imitate your TCP stack better. They could imitate your DNS responses better. Um, depending on the type of attacker, it, it's, uh, it's kind of varying. So if you're on a backbone, you have a different kind of capacity and you have a different sort of memory, so to speak. But if you're on a local network and you have a very small segment, then there's almost no limit to what you can do. So it's important to not trigger that. So you want confidentiality. And you also want to make sure that when you send a request, the receiver of the request knows that it's exactly what you, what you sent. And so you need integrity as well. And of course, um, since TCP IP is, I mean, about as uh, open as you can get, you need to make sure that you don't directly connect to the thing that you want to connect to. Because if you do that, there's a pretty good chance that the thing you're connecting to, if it's high profile, like for example, Facebook, um, or Twitter or something like this. Um, it's actual IP addresses for, for, for whatever services that they use for hosting their website. Um, those IPs will actually be in the, in the block list. Um, and so you want to have an intermediary in between. Um, so the idea with Tor is that we sort of provide all of this and then some accidentally as, uh, as part of being an, an anonymity system. So um, I guess some of you have probably used Tor. Any of you? Yeah? Okay. Who here has never used Tor, I guess, is the question. Just like one guy, one guy in the corner, <laughs> two guys? All right, cool. Sorry it's low. Um, I mean, you know, you, how fast do you want to die? So um, Tor, basically, if we were to go through it, it would take quite some time. There are like hours long lectures where we can talk about circuits and we can talk about cells and we can talk about the crypto and stuff like that. But in short, it allows you to do most of the things you want to do on the internet anonymously where you get all of these things that I was previously mentioning, right? You want these, these different properties. You want a lot more than those properties, but those are the most important ones. Um, so you can make DNS queries through Tor, um, but you don't get the ability to make arbitrary UDP packets. So there's a big difference, right? We have um, a DNS port, which is like a DNS server, and uh, you can make DNS queries, and those queries will allow you to connect to sites. So if you have to deal with DNS blocking, you can just use Tor for your DNS if that's the only filter, and if you don't care about anything else, it will transport your DNS requests just fine. And um, there's a uh, guy who's here, his name is Colin Mulner. We've been working on this project called TTDNSD, and it allows you to um, make arbitrary DNS requests through Tor by making TCP connections um, to recursive DNS servers that are upstream, and it uses the Tor network first. Um, and that means that if you're only worried about DNS blocking, you don't have to worry about Tor being slow because you can do all your DNS resolves and then just connect directly. And unless the IP address is actually blocked uh, or the content of the messages you're sending are blocked, you can sort of do a hybrid thing to get around some kinds of filtering. Um, anyway, in short, the way that Tor works is that you have this large network. It's essentially a peer-to-peer -peer network with a series of directory authorities. All of our directory authorities are, of course, blocked in China. Um, so at the moment, um, a client in China actually has some amount of trouble connecting to the Tor network. Um, so we'll get to that. So 
the 60th anniversary of some guy making this country, uh, the PRC, happened recently. And when that happened, um, they blocked the Tor network. So what they did is they downloaded a list of relays, which is the directory authorities give out a list of relays. That's how clients make routing decisions. It's a source-based routing protocol. So the source says, I want to route through three hops. Uh, these are my three hops. It builds a circuit. There's cryptographic uh, handshakes that happen in each step of the way, so you know who you're talking to is who you think you're talking to. And um, the problem is that if you can't get that list, you can't build that circuit and you can't make your connection. So what the Chinese government did on the 60th anniversary or five days before is they downloaded that list and tossed it into the Great Firewall. So now we have this problem, which is that if you want to connect directly, you need a new intermediary. You can't just use the normal Tor network as your intermediary to connect to, for example, Facebook or Jabber or whatever you want. Um, so it's a problem. Like all that crypto, all that integrity and confidentiality you got, it's totally like it doesn't matter because you're blocked. So we can't solve this problem very easily in that you have um, 2,000 IP addresses, which you have to give to everyone so that they can use this system to be secure. And if you don't give those IP addresses to everyone, you have a partitioning problem, which means that you can give one section of the network to one person and one section to another. And you can't do that in an, anonym, in an anonymity system because if you do, you, you start to be able to partition users' behavior and you start to be able to potentially de-anonymize them. So instead of partitioning, what we did is we came up with this idea um, which is called bridges. Um, and I'll get to that in just a second. But first I want to talk about single hop versus multi hop. So part of the reason that you want to have multiple hops when you're using the Tor network is that you don't want to have a privacy by policy system. So if any of you use a VPN, you know that you, what you're basically saying to the VPN provider is, okay, you know who I am, you know where I'm connecting from, and you know everything I do online, but you promise you won't write it down. Okay, you, you wrote it down, you promise you won't tell anyone. Okay, you, you shared it with your critical business partners, but you won't share it with like, I don't know, law enforcement or someone that breaks into your systems. Okay, you share it with them for like specific things, and like you, you see this path where it goes. And we, we want to build something stronger than that because even if the proxy operator is 100% honest and everything is totally solid, they can still be monitored, right? Every machine on the internet is near another one that can be compromised. So you want to make sure that you are not using just a single hop and you also want to make sure that your traffic is mixed with other people so that it's extremely difficult to sort of like decide which traffic is the most interesting um, and hopefully that can be helpful to you. And the way that Tor tries to avoid this type of surveillance is that we we, we know that there's a correlation attack, which is that incoming traffic and outgoing traffic can be correlated and then you can de-anonymize someone. So if it's just a very small network like a VPN provider, that's trivial. If it's a global network that spans every country in the world, that becomes very difficult to block and very difficult to surveil. And even if it, every country was cooperating legally, it's still technically very difficult, but they're not cooperating legally, so it's also very socially very difficult. Um, so. Bridges are how we solve the Chinese uh, blocking problem. This is also how we solve it in Iran and in a number of other countries. Um, and you know, I'm pretty happy to say and kind of proud, most of the bridges that I've seen are actually run by Americans and Germans. Um, there are some people from Sweden, a lot of people from Sweden actually that run relays as well. Um, but most of the bridges that I've seen are, are actually in the United States and in Germany, which is pretty awesome. I mean, people here really care about free speech. It's very, it's very inspiring to see that. So what a bridge is is essentially a relay, just like the relays that are in the directory authority. So you can do cryptographic operations with them and you can send them data and build circuits and attach streams. But the difference is they're not in the directory at all. So they don't, they don't exist, basically, as far as anyone else is concerned. So you need to connect to the Tor network, but you don't want to have a privacy by policy system. So what you do is you connect to a bridge that maybe um, I run for Anthony. Like if I ran one in California, I don't tell anybody about it, but I tell him, maybe by communicating with him in some other way over chat or something. He can connect to me, but he doesn't want to trust me with all of his sensitive information. So he connects to me and then from that Tor automatically uses that bridge to bridge into the Tor network. And now he's in the Tor network and he doesn't have to trust me and the Tor network doesn't know he's coming from China anymore. So it's extremely difficult to target him. So. Um, Interesting thing here is that when these blocking events happen with China, they harvest this information. So we have two types of bridges. We have public bridges and private bridges. Um, public bridges are essentially just like relays except instead of going to a directory, they go to what's called the bridge authority or the bridge DB. And we have a website, bridges.torproject.org, which will give you bridges. 
And the way that works is that we have this hash ring essentially and if you are coming from a certain set of IP addresses you're in one section of the hash ring and if you are sending an email to bridges at torproject.org you again enter the hash ring in a different position and every time you make a request you enter in the same position so you always get the same bucket of IP addresses. So no one party can easily harvest the entire hash ring of data. Um, I mean it is of course possible for example if you have like 10,000 Gmail accounts to send 10,000 requests and get them. But what we're doing is offloading that work so that they have to break Google's capture instead of some capture that we spend months engineering or something. So it's possible but it just it changes it a little bit. It makes it a little bit easier for us. Um, so like the Tor network is one geographic location um, and China is another geographic location and of course the interesting thing is the public bridges have actually all been harvested. So on a regular basis people go to um, bridges.torproject.org and bridges at torproject.org and they get all the bridges and put them into the great firewall. So they're actively harvesting things that take a great deal of effort to try to block access to the Tor network. And actually at the moment unless you have a private bridge there's a really good chance that you can't use Tor in China right now which is really extremely disappointing. But it's not because of protocol filtering. It's just because of IP port and uh, IP address blocking in the, in the firewall. So unfortunately um, because they are able to adapt and to grab this information it's sort of um, it's kind of a cat and mouse game. But we did take it from something we can never win which is a public list that we give to everyone and we, we reduced it to a private list that sometimes is given to some people but in some cases like private bridges they're not given away at all. The private bridges always continue to work. The public ones don't. So some people will have access to this network and some people won't because they're spending lots of someone's taxpayer dollars to do that. Um, an interesting side effect of this is that when they harvest, so I run one of the Tor directory authorities, um, they connect to me potentially or to someone else and they pull down that list of IP addresses and then they put that into the firewall. Does anybody see a problem with that? Like this is kind of a funny like an unintended consequence here would be that if all of the Tor network decided to do this all the directory authorities could for example put in the IP addresses of every place where you request a visa to leave the country and then all of a sudden none of those sites work anymore because they're all blocked. Right? So there's a kind of funny thing here when you know that you are the source of information for censorship you can affect the outcome of that censorship. Um, we have not done that and I think it's probably not a wise thing to um, <laughs> to fuck with the bull unless you're willing to get the horns. <laughs> but I guess those of you that know me know that I probably don't have a problem with that. So uh, in the future I'm, I can imagine that you might see something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> although I don't think the Tor project wants to do that so it probably won't happen. But uh, how much does what cost? Pay you off. To pay me off? <laughs> um, Dying of fire. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry to all of those that have actually died in a fire. <laughs> um, so here's the deal. If you run a bridge you can actually help someone, right? You can help someone directly right now. I mean I, ha I hate to sound like you know the save the children woman or something but um, you know. Unfortunately censorship is a really big problem and it's not trivial to make it go away because it's socially very successful. A lot of people really believe that they should not have access to information and they should not be able to make decisions on their own and that someone else is better making decisions for them and that they don't need autonomy or agency in order to make changes in the world. Um, I say fuck that straight up, right? <laughs> if you're if you're not clapping, I'm a little disappointed. And if you are clapping, you can run a bridge and you can also do this, right? It doesn't take anything special. It's a peer to peer network. It's as easy as clicking, you know, an install and checking a box. And you literally help people. And while in some cases China is harvesting it, interestingly enough, the Chinese government isn't sharing their block lists with other countries. So everybody else has to reproduce this effort, which means that since they're not doing that, your bridge is still useful in a lot of other places like Iran or Canada or here or wherever you happen to be that does some sort of network censorship. Um, hey, anyway, um, that's it. Check that single box and you can, you can do it automatically. And you have no liability. If you do this they can only connect to the rest of the Tor network. So there's no harm that can possibly come to you unless Tor were to become illegal which it's not going to. Um, thanks. Yep.
Jacob. In this uh, last part, uh, we'll be talking a little bit further detail on the, the technical operation of uh, the, the Green Dam software that uh, Anthony hinted about. And I think it makes a, a good transition from uh, uh, Jake's slides, the fact that, uh, you know, the, the success of these uh, Tor bridges and the Tor network in general has really uh, sort of changed the game in terms of censorship. Um, a lot of these entities, whether they're governments or other organizations trying to impose the censorship software, sort of have this fine balance they need to strike. Um, obviously, if China really wanted to crack down on their network, they could go with a whitelisting approach where they're only going to allow certain websites, but that would make for a lot of angry citizens and also a lot of you know outrage. Um, so when they kind of play this this whack-a-mole game where they're they're going after um, you know tour bridges or trying to harvest these these addresses of the um, the bridges to block this, it turns out to be this this sort of leaky sieve where um, these bridge IPs can be passed around privately and, and distributed in sort of a peer-to-peer -peer social fashion. Um, so you know I I, I think that uh, when when these entities or these governments are are looking at this this problem. They think, hey, you know, why don't we push the same functionality that we have down to the end host where we'll have more control. We'll actually be able to inspect upon the, uh, the processes that the guest is running, uh, have more flexibility, and have more protection against uh, a user potentially trying to evade or remove the, the censorship functionality. functionality excuse me. So, uh, whoa, sorry about the formatting there. Uh, I think uh, some open office uh, nuances. Uh, Green Dam is uh, the host-based censorship software that was introduced by the, the Chinese government. Um, this was, uh, I think, early last year is when they first announced it. And originally they were saying, hey, all PCs that are sold in China are going to come with this Green Dam software. And there was, you know, a, a bit of a, a hoopla around that, uh, that announcement. And, you know, they kind of slowly backed down as, as more and more information came out about this Green Dam software and, you know, how uh, port was built and some of the components that were stolen to build it, um, the Chinese government kind of backed down. And I, I think now it's, it's, it's still deployed in um, um, like internet cafes where uh, users might not have full control over their computer. And I think they might be rolling it out to um, like schools and stuff too or other government organizations. Actually, they are out of funding, but they have target to move, to move this product to sell in Taiwan. Yeah, there was, a, there was an announcement recently that uh, they, they lost their government funding, the company that was developing the Green Dam software, uh, which is not surprising because they did a, a pretty poor job. Um, so uh, again, no, no titles. I apologize for the formatting here. But uh, these are the features of the Green Dam software, what Anthony uh, briefly went over. They have a, a content filter which you know, looks at the um, actual content you're creating in these applications. Like if you're writing a Word document or writing in a text file, as Anthony showed the screenshot for, it will actually pop up that nice, uh, nice little warning which, I don't know, what does that translate to, Anthony? The Chinese message? Yeah. Um, this message is inappropriate. Uh, it will be filtered. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and there's also uh, there's also these uh, network filtering capabilities that are you know deployed on the end host, but you know filter the network connections uh, coming out of it. And they actually did steal some software or some blacklists from the uh, cyber city company, just like straight up pulled down their blacklists and included them in the software, um, which was was pretty blatant. And uh, I think there were some 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 lawsuits over over that. Um, also, the image pornography filtering using the OpenCV package, which looks for these skin tones in the picture. So, you know, that baby picture that Anthony showed has a lot of skin tone colors, so that's why it was uh, uh, considered inappropriate. Um, but the bonus features are the, are the interesting ones where, uh, you know, there were some very, very poor programming practices once you start digging into the uh, Green Dam software. You know, trivial stuff like uh, some of my colleagues at the University of Michigan, like the first thing they tried, they, uh, they, you know, had a long URL that you click on. That URL is actually inspected by Green Dam, and it's just a straight smack, uh, a stack smash um, just with a long URL. This is like, you know, 1990s uh, programming mistakes. Um, so uh, th those features uh, are, are not necessarily uh, what we're going to focus on today, but we're going to look at you know, how Green Dam actually operates and how it actually hooks into your host um, and sort of the, the techniques we use to actually unhook those hooks. Um, so there's a, a wide range of interposition mechanisms that Green Dam employs. Um, the one that you guys might be most familiar with, if you're familiar with uh, any sort of rootkits or uh, sort of uh, Ring 3 rootkits. Um, they can hook these. There's an API called Set Windows Hook, which allows you to uh, be notified of certain activity, like uh, window messages or, or keyboard activity. Um, so you can some some you know poor keyloggers will use Set Windows Hook in order to uh, get your keystrokes. Uh, it also uses the Winsock LSP, which is um, mostly a headache for normal users. Uh, the layered service provider functionality by Winsock. When people install LSPs and then try to remove them, it usually ends up borking the entire Winsock stack. Um, 
These guys hooked uh, you know, a number of your traditional wind sock socket calls to inspect on the traffic that's going in and out of your system. Um, and that's in one of the DLLs that's injected into all the processes on your machine. Um, and lastly, there was a, you know, a, a number of uh, API hooks they use, um, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, the techniques that are, are used to uh, uh, inject the DLLs and also uh, hook the API calls. And there's a list of these, uh, I think, processes. I think Anthony showed a, a screenshot of you know, particular processes by name that are targeted. Um, so a lot of this stuff, if you change your process name, you won't be targeted. But uh, you, know, you might not be able to do that without administrator privileges. So traditionally, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, rootkits or uh, API hooking, uh, there's sort of two ways to go about it. You can go about it the good way and actually write a kernel driver, which will actually protect um, the integrity of your hooks in the user space applications. Or you can go the lazy route, which is what these guys did with the uh, ring three uh, rootkits or ring three hooking, um, which is when you actually implement these API hooking functionality in user space in memory of the, the process. So you're sort of on this, this uh, even ground. So traditionally how this happens is you can either patch the import address table um, when you're actually injecting yourself into um, different processes on the system or you can actually do sort of the trampolines where you will overwrite um, the first few bytes of each function or to jump to your hooking code and then re rewrite the uh, instruction that used to be there and jump back. And this is what's used in, you know, fairly poor, poorly written uh, rootkits in spyware. Um, so what you would do is you inject into all the running processes on the system using this create remote thread functionality in the Windows platform, which is uh, awesome functionality uh, for rootkits and malware authors, um, but it can also be used, uh, I guess, for good purposes. We're going to use it. Um, but essentially it allows you to actually, you know, like, it, like it says, create a remote thread in a process, allocate memory in that process, put your, uh, put your executable code into that process, and then execute it within the context of that remote process. Um, so by doing this, you can inject into all the running processes, hook the create process call inside each of those processes such that when they launch further processes, you're able to sort of spread virally into those new processes as well. Um, so how GreenDam works is it injects itself into these, this list of processes, whether it's Firefox or Notepad, and then we can actually go in and just uninject all of the, uh, all of the GreenDam code that's been put in there. So that's what I did. I wrote a tool called uh, DamBurst which I, I think is interesting uh, from the standpoint that uh, us security researchers don't usually get to use our, our skills for uh, good purposes, so to speak. Um, the same techniques that, that Danvers uh, uses are, are good for, you know, writing rootkits. But, you know, when we can actually use this, this uh, functionality and, and our skills to help users um, who are facing the censorship, it's kind of a win-win because you get to do something that's technically interesting, but it also has a, a, a good side effect on, on society. So while there were these interesting vulnerabilities in the GreenDam software which would allow us to own all of China, um, it's, it's always good to try to help the users as opposed to uh, infecting them. Um, so a few properties about Danvers which, you know, we tried to make uh, more friendly for users who might be in restricted environments. Um, it doesn't require administrator privileges. Obviously if you have administrator privileges you can remove or uninstall the, the GreenDam software. But in many of these cases where you're in an internet cafe or, or other public computers, you might not have the, you don't, you don't own the box so you might not have admin rights and you might not be able to remove the software. And we also made this uh, a very uh, transient functionality such that it doesn't leave behind a lot of evidence um, that you were running it. So if you were in an internet cafe and you bursted a few of the, the processes on that box in order to evade the censorship um, and someone else came to that box later to look at it, they wouldn't know that you had done this and you can kind of get away uh, scot-free. And, and lastly, of course, it, it actually, by uninjecting the uh, Danvers routines that are vulnerable, it actually increases the security of your computer because you're sort of cutting off these vulnerable code paths uh, from being executed. So the injection process works like so. Um, as I mentioned, these are all uh, standard parts of Win32 which allow you to allocate uh, memory in the remote processes and actually write your code into that process and then uh, start a thread um, based out of that uh, DLL that you just loaded. Um, and similarly, um, for the patching of the uh, WinSock LSPs, um, once we're actually running code in inside of the process of the, uh, the, same, the same process that's been uh, infected with uh, GreenDAM, we can simply uh, overwrite the LSP since removing them are pain in the ass. We can simply uh, overwrite them with no ops and uh, just make sure that uh, uh, its functionality is effectively neutered. So we, we pop into each process, we patch out the uh, uh, functionality of, of, of GreenDAM, and then we unload it lastly to make sure that the vulnerable routines are no longer in there. And I wanted to show you guys a demo, um, but I don't have the VM on, on this laptop. Um, but this is what it would look like. You know, you're searching for porn or whatever you really want to find down there. 
Um, immediately when you hit enter, nothing happens. The, the connection's interrupted, and Green Dam has filtered that because it recognizes it as an offensive word. Um, and you can see that in the little uh, screenshot near the bottom there, you see the handler, inject lib, db filter, surf guard, those are all DLLs that uh, um, Green Dam has injected. And in the Green Dam uh, snapshot, you can see the applications that are specifically targeted by Green Dam in red. So you see you know, Firefox and Notepad there have a full, have all of the DLLs injected into their process address space. Um, and some of the other ones are just partially injected. They don't have all the same filtering routines injected into those processes. Um, but you can select any process that you want to burst it or you can just click burst all. Our code will go in there and uh, burst all those processes such that this is disabled. And you can search for your porn uh, successfully or your politically motivated uh, material, whatever you're looking for that Green Dam does not approve of. So, you know, getting back to the uh, uh, sort of the theme of this, um, Green Dam was a initial attempt at this, this host based sensorware. And as I mentioned, the news report that was recently released uh, took all the government funding from this company that was developing Green Dam. And you know, from this first attempt, we can see that they did a pretty poor job. Um, they didn't hire the right company. They didn't uh, you know, cross their T's and dot their I's uh, before releasing this. And they weren't, I don't think they were really aware of the, the, the backlash they would get and the quality of the code that they were releasing. Um, so it is kind of scary to think that you know, in the future, they're definitely going to do a much better job. I mean, they're not going to make the same mistakes. Um, and I think that the success of the, the tools that uh, uh, Tor is providing and that, that Jacob is providing um, will only drive more entities and government organizations to approach this censorship problem from the host-based level. Um, so I, I think we'll undoubtedly see uh, more of this host-based censorship software. And I did see just a few weeks ago an article about uh, a new green dam or a host-based censorship software in Vietnam. And I haven't looked into that at all, but um, it's not surprising. I think we'll see a lot more of this in the future. And with that, Anthony, you want to conclude? Yep. Um, thank you. John actually presented, and I would like to just, and so Jake also presented like a, like a short brief of a conclusion. Actually, I suppose the internet censorship happens in everywhere, okay? So how, however, we need to have a balance between them, the monitoring and privacy and free for information. And we are not target, I'm not target to take a 18 hour flights to here to bring my country. However, the problem is we have the issues, we have the, some areas to improve the technologies, okay? So how to, to uh, get more, I mean, uh, for, uh, more for, uh, step forward from the research. And special friends to Jacob, John, and, a bit, and also to give this censorship, I mean, this talk with us then, and also I'm thankful to my um, teammates, um, Sam, Jackie, and Charles, and my professor, and Rocky, and he gives me a lot of insights in the censorship and the network uh, monitoring. And my and Chinese bloggers, like I said, and Digital Boy, then the Chou Lima is Purchase from uh, Digital Boy in $100 in 10 Chulima. <laughs> and also my wife and my dog's family. This is my head of army. <laughs> and it's uh, my elder sister. And uh, Gigi is the head of, uh, has the wife then. Thank you.